Center on Freedom of Religion or Belief to deliver a public lecture. As a master of ceremony, I thank you for your energy and attention in this outstanding event. I give the floor to Ibu Renata as moderator and close today's agenda. See you next day. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So, so this evening we will have important session with Professor Heiner Bielfeld, who was a United Nations Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Religion or Belief in 20, uh, 2010 to 2016, yeah? And for a long time, is a professor for human rights and human rights politics at the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg, Germany. So this session would be very interesting because many times during our advocacy for for societal peace may be overlooked. In the debate of human rights advocacy, vis a vis interest-based advocacy, many times peace is simplified into public order, in which freedom, justice, and equality may not necessarily in consideration. So the, mis the misunderstanding of FORP to protect only minorities, but not majorities, are the reason it is being rejected. So this evening, we will listen Professor Heiner to those misunderstandings and what would be the real meaning of FORP. So I think we will have 30 minutes for your presentation, Professor Heiner, and then we will have another 30 minutes for uh, question and answer. And uh, we will have also the interpreter, uh, Miki Salman, to help us during the, uh, during the, uh, the presentations for those who may not be uh, uh, able to speak in Bahasa, uh, in English, sorry. And then during the question and answer, I think we'll have a continuous uh, interpretation. So Miki will uh, translate your, uh, the, uh, uh, your, uh, your uh, questions for uh, Professor Heiner. So I think the floor is yours, Professor Heiner, please. Thank you very much, uh, Renata, for your kind words of introduction. Uh, Thanks, uh, a warm thank you to the organizers of this conference. Um, I am uh, happy to be part of it. Even though I can't afford to travel to Indonesia, the semester is still running here in Germany uh, with 40 degrees Celsius. I mean, it's quite a challenge. I'm sure uh, it's even more challenging in Indonesia. Uh, so, uh, I already heard you have uh, 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 interesting and uh, substantial uh, uh, discussions. So, I'm glad now to uh, contribute maybe uh, uh, something from a slightly different angle, maybe not from a different angle, uh, but it's something I think we tend to neglect that uh, freedom of religion or belief has something to offer, something to offer to societal peace. Uh, we tend to neglect that because uh, there is always the assumption freedom of religion or belief deals with minorities, with dissidents, with critics, and that is certainly true. It's certainly true, but it's only part of the story. At the same time, freedom of religion or belief is also important for broader societies, also for religious majorities, uh, because it is a, it's a contribution to societal peace based on respect. And uh, here I would like to now uh, share my screen. I hope it will work. I have prepared a, a short PowerPoint and uh, could, uh, could uh, anyone maybe uh, indicate whether this is readable? So by giving me a signal, thumbs, is that readable? Yes. Okay, fine. So I will uh, uh, now go through that um, uh, very simple uh, PowerPoint. So uh, the contribution of four freedom of religion or belief to societal peace. And uh, uh, okay, uh, the, the relationship between human rights and peace uh, comes out very clearly already in the famous Universal Declaration, the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which in its preamble uh, makes that connection between human rights and peace by uh, proclaiming human rights as the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Now you may think this is just a postulate. 
perhaps even worse, it's just wishful thinking. So how can human rights effectively contribute to peace? Okay, I think uh, uh, the answer is human rights are not just norms. Human rights require building a culture of respect, not only a culture of respect, a public culture, but also in conjunction with that culture, institutions, public institutions of respect. And uh, I mean, institutions uh, that uh, are supposed to provide transparency, accountability, especially those in power should be accountable and they should be held to accountability, to account by institutions of checks and balancing, by institutions of independent monitoring, where also NGOs can play an active role. And accountability, of course, always requires the question or, or, or begs the question, accountable to, to whom? And here the answer is, I mean, with the idea of universal rights, public institutions should be accountable to all to all those affected, to all the citizens, to all human beings. And that's, I mean, the culture of respect in conjunction with institutions, with workable institutions, monitoring institutions, is the antidote to collective narrow-mindedness. You know, I mean, uh, it's also an antidote to corruption and corruption is uh, one of the major causes of human rights violations in the world because, I mean, uh, corruption, destroys trust. It destroys trust in public institutions, sometimes to the degree that people think, I mean, there are no institutions that deserve even the adjective public because uh, all the existing governmental institutions somehow cater to those in power, to certain networks of oligarchs. And maybe sometimes even in some countries, even the judiciary may look like just another mafia. And I mean, that uh, mistrust that uh, develops where corruption becomes endemic, uh, breeds narrow-mindedness, hysteria, hatred, conspiracy protections. So the only antidote, the only antidote that I am aware of is a culture of human rights. And it's not just a culture, it's also an institutional setting, a culture of human rights in combination with such a set of institutions uh, specialized on uh, monitoring, uh, periodic monitoring also with the involvement of NGOs. And uh, I mean, that of course, it's a long-term pro uh, project. And the purpose is to facilitate something that I consider enormously important as, as, uh, as, as a key also for peace, critical trust, critical trust. I mean, the, the peace building potential of human rights in general, and for in, in, in particular, that peace building potential very much depends on the trust building functions of human rights. Trust, trust is a key word. And when talking about trust in an open society, in a democratic society, of course, the idea is critical trust, uh, not blind trust. Yeah, not blind obedience, no, a critical trust where people can also raise questions, where people can uh, express um, uh, maybe also skepticism, where they can raise issues, where can also, also maybe talk about uh, 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 brave uh, problems that they are facing. It's the critical trust, a critical trust that respects people, everyone, as subjects of their own volition, of their own uh, independent opinions and as subjects that can also actively contribute to uh, the society. So the facilitation of a critical trust, not blind trust, is really where I would locate the peace building potential of human rights in general. And now let's turn to, from human rights in general to, up, to fork, to freedom of religion or belief in particular. Of course, I mean, freedom of religion or belief has a specific function within the uh, broader range of human rights. It's the one right that deals with religion. So also the peace building potential of four, of course, has much to do with inter-religious relations. So with the handling of religious diversity, 
which of course harbors many, many problems and also risks and pitfalls and misunderstandings. And uh, we see uh, in many, many societies across the globe that religion can become a, a, a source of peace, but sometimes also a source of conflict, of misunderstanding, sometimes even violence, not only, sometimes in quite a number of countries, even violence occurs in the name of religion. So four is the one human right, the one right within the broader range of human right that specifically deals with religiosity. However, and now um, uh, 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 there's, a, there's a very important qualification that I have to add. Uh, of course, uh, four deals with religion, but ultimately uh, the focus is always on human beings. Uh, the legal protection that FORB provides does not directly protect religion, religiosity, belief systems, but it protects the believers. It protects human beings, not religions as such. Uh, I'm insisting on that clarification because it is a source of many, many misunderstandings, including for instance, uh, misunderstandings that culminate in blasphemy laws. And I know this is also a big issue in Indonesia. That's why I'm really uh, uh, emphasizing this point. Right holders are human beings. Why? First of all, human beings are vulnerable beings. So human beings need protection. Human beings need protection. And also with regard to their religious convictions. But then there is also another reason, and that is religion only exists in the plural, not the one religion, but different religions. And even within one and the same religious tradition, different interpretations. So to take religion seriously means to take religions in the plural seriously. I mean, to really be aware of that vast variety of beliefs, questions, positions, convictions, practices, uh, individual and communitarian practices, ceremonies, institutions. So religion is a huge, huge area of diversity. And the one common denominator within that diversity, the one common denominator is whatever religion you're talking about, it's always human beings who believe or not or don't believe, who practice, who build institutions, who pass on their convictions to the next generations. So it's always the human being that somehow uh, is involved in religious beliefs, in religious practices. That is the one common denominator. And this one common denominator, human beings, at the same time also um, um, displays various vulnerabilities. And so human beings are also in need of that protection. And it is for this reason that FORP has a consistent focus on human beings. So human beings are the right holders. And duty bearers are in particular states. So the state under FORP is in charge of providing an open space so that diversity, the diversity of religions and religious practices can unfold. Diversity without fear and diversity without discrimination. And that is of course a long-term project and it has much to do with trust building again, trust building, peace building through trust building. Now, let me continue to talk about diversity because the understanding of diversity under FORP is very, very broad. Why? Because human beings are so diverse. I mean, the, the, the focus on human beings implies uh, necessarily implies that you open up an enormous and um, uh, an inexhaustible range of possibilities, of options, of interpretations, of convictions, of forms of religiosities, types of religiosities, and all the misunderstandings that sometimes occur with that diversity. But diversity must be understood in a very, very broad manner. So for, for example, diversity cannot be limited to any state-imposed 
list. Let me give you one example. I had a fact-finding mission in Kazakhstan when serving as a special rapporteur on freedom of religion or belief in Kazakhstan. And the government authorities in government, they were uh, in Kazakhstan, they were very proud to say, we actually, in this country, we are 18 religions, 18 religions. My answer was always, it's only 18. I can't believe that. Yeah? I can't believe that because you have millions of people living in that country. So how come you, you, only, you only know of 18? Yeah? Because, I mean, actually we have so different interpretations, also reform movements within the various traditions. So no one should pretend to even know how many religions exist in a particular country. Religious diversity is very, very broad, not limited to any specific list. And diversity is no less important within various religious traditions, not only between your Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Confucianism, Buddhism, but the, the between, I mean, that is uh, what, we, what we see in textbooks. Uh, there the world seems to be rather orderly, neatly ordered in different chapters. But I mean, the, the diversity also exists within various religious traditions. So let's take the example of Islam. Of course, we have different branches of Islam. And within each of these branches, different interpretations of Islam. And that, that is a reality, of course, also currently played out in Indonesia, as you know so much better than I. Uh, so, and all this must be taken seriously when talking about religious diversity. Um, and yet another level, the focus being on human beings, on humans. We have, of course, also to, 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 to take into account the diversity of life worlds, uh, men and women, different generations. So for example, in many of the summits, the interreligious summits, okay, there's a shortage of women, there's a shortage of young people. And it's so important really to come uh, uh, that this diversity, this existing diversity in, with the inclusion of women, young people, critics, dissenters really comes to the fore. I mean, that is the understanding of diversity under freedom of religion or belief. So of course, I mean, that's broad diversity also need um, protection. We need the state, the state institutions that are in charge of facilitating such diversity, of opening up that space where diversity can, in, can unfold. And also we need the state to also provide protection. Uh, uh, that open space for diversity can uh, of course collapse due to forces from within, but it can also collapse uh, due to, uh, as a result of attacks coming from outside. So also we need the state to really do religion in a way, we need also religious activities of the state, not in order to protect certain understandings of orthodoxy, not in order to, un, to, to, uh, to protect a, a certain legacy, a particular legacy, but we need the state to protect freedom of religion or belief. I mean, that is the human rights approach. And one example, the one that I've chosen here is also uh, protection from incitement to hatred. And uh, the need uh, to provide that protection is obvious, and you can find it also reflected in international human rights law. For example, Article 20, I should have added paragraph two, Article 20, paragraph two of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, and also Indonesia is a, is, is a, is a state party to that covenant. I mean, that uh, Article 20, paragraph two, um, uh, um, reminds states of their responsibility to, pr to provide protection against incitement. And incitement to hatred, that means acts of hatred. It's not only derogatory speech, yeah, but acts of hatred, uh, uh, acts of discrimination, acts of violence, or other manifestations of hatred, in particular also collective hatred. So here we need uh, the protective function of the state. And that's also a demand of 
fork of freedom of religion or belief. Now, entry hate, uh, hatred offenses, the crimes, need to be defined very clearly and narrowly. I mean, that is also um, a requirement of the rule of law, that uh, when it comes to defining criminal law norms, criminal offenses, uh, uh, there's always a temptation for states to, 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 to be very broad and to operate on the base of ill-defined crimes, which give the administration a lot of leeway uh, but that can lead to also uh, uh, to targeting uh, minorities, to arbitrariness. Uh, so that's why, I mean, uh, a state governed by principles of rule of law has to make sure that these offenses uh, are defined very clearly and narrowly. And quite importantly, I'm saying this also with regard to the discussion in Indonesia, uh, entry hatred laws, criminal laws, should never be confused with anti blasphemy laws. I know there is a huge discussion in Indonesia, a long discussion on blasphemy laws, and uh, blasphemy laws uh, are highly problematic. I mean, entry hatred, hatred laws are necessary. And there we have to, of course, we have to, 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 to link them to all the safeguards just mentioned, I mean, clear definitions, rule of law, principles, et cetera. But, okay, but entry hatred laws are somehow a, a necessary requirement of Article 20 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. With anti blasphemy laws, that is a totally different story. And uh, uh, the uh, Human Rights Committee of the United Nations has, um, in a general comment, um, clearly uh, called upon states to repeal existing blasphemy laws uh, because they are not compatible with the human rights approach. I mean, they pretend to protect religion. They pretend to protect the honor, the reputation of religion, but then typically they single out specific religions for extra protection. And that goes at the expense of an open discussion, at the expense of uh, dissidents, of critics. So anti-blasphemy laws are not in the interest of freedom of religion or belief. They are not compatible with the human rights approach broadly. Uh, and I think that is a very important point. Um, I remember also previous discussions that we had online or also in Indonesia that, uh, so one cannot be clear enough in really uh, making this point, blasphemy laws are not in the interest of four, because I mean they uh, they somehow um, ignore the fact that what requires protection is the human being, and that's why we need anti hatred offenses, not blasphemy offenses. Uh, maybe that is also something we uh, can discuss then in a few minutes. I come to my second last slide. So uh, apart from uh, providing protection um, uh, from uh, uh, incitement to hatred against any acts of hatred, uh, what is also needed and where also the state can play a productive role is in convening inter-religious communication so that the various religious communities come together uh, and meet on the basis of respect. Respect is actually the one key principle underneath all the human rights, respect for human dignity, the human being as a responsible subject. So uh, interreligious communication based on respect. Uh, I think that is a fourth requirement. And let me just give you a, a few examples. And there you can also see uh, uh, the uh, peace building potential, the trust building potential, of a Forb culture, of a culture based on freedom of religion or belief uh, for all. A few examples, um, Nigeria. Um, uh, Nigeria, I remember coming across um, a project of uh, malaria prevention uh, with uh, very obvious practical significance. Okay, every, no one, no one uh, requires any, needs any, any instruction why malaria uh, prevention is important. That is everyday experience. Uh, but it was a project in this initiated, jointly initiated by a Catholic archbishop and by a high-ranking Islamic cleric, an imam. 
So here we have a project, and for me, I mean, that has a paradigmatic significance that it both very practical and of obvious practical significance and at the same time of high symbolic significance. Yeah. So the combination of practical purposes, malaria prevention with symbolic messages is really uh, very helpful. Uh, and I could uh, give you many examples. For instance, uh, Cyprus, I was uh, very glad to witness um, um, initiatives coming from both parts of Cyprus. Uh, Cyprus is, a, is an island divided into a northern part and a southern part, uh, and uh, where also different religious communities are uh, the, the, the traditionally dominant ones, uh, uh, Islam in the north, uh, Greek Orthodox Christianity in the south. Okay, and then um, in some projects, uh, young people, youngsters from both parts, from the north and the, and the south, together renovated churches or other religious buildings, mosques that had been uh, abused as stables after warfare in the 1960s, 1970s. I mean, dilapidated, destroyed uh, churches in the north, uh, 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 synagogues in the south, or mosques in the south, and uh, young people doing that together. I mean, jointly uh, um, um, restoring uh, these religious buildings to houses of worship, to liturgical use again. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful experience that they can work together and also cross uh, denominational religious lines. Wonderful experience. Last example, Lebanon. I once attended um, a ceremony uh, in a Catholic church, in a Maronite church. Uh, the Maronites are a branch of Catholicism, uh, where, uh, 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 okay, the, uh, an, an Islamic Imam, a Sunni Islam, was reading from the Quran. It was the celebration of St. Mary's Annunciation, a story told both in the Bible and in the Quran. And uh, in Lebanon, that has become a public holiday celebrated by Muslims and Christians together, sometimes in a church, sometimes in a mosque. And you hear people reading from the Quran, reciting the Quran against uh, the ringing of church bells. And I um, mean, that is a rather nice plant. And again, here we have a highly symbolic, a highly symbolic uh, uh, ceremony. But at the same time, uh, I've also seen um, uh, projects uh, uh, where um, um, imams and, and church leaders together uh, work uh, uh, on behalf uh, of prison inmates. Uh, prisons can, of course, be a breeding ground uh, of religious radicalism. So, I mean, really uh, to cater to prison inmates is, uh, of course, again, very important. And here we can once again uh, combine uh, practical uh, work with also uh, conveying uh, symbolic messages. Uh, okay, I mean, in order to really unfold its trust building potential, uh, it's important to involve many people, and of course, including women, including young people. Only by having a broad ownership can such uh, projects really uh, unfold their trust building potential in a sustainable manner. And the church has a role to play in this regard, the, the state as the the one institution also in charge of guaranteeing human rights, of, of guaranteeing for, uh, has a responsibility to also facilitate such uh, inter-religious communication cooperation without uh, claiming any monopoly in this regard. Now I come to my final slide. Um, you can see the, the headline, peace, not tranquility. So the keywords uh, that I've somehow repeatedly also uh, emphasized in my short talk is peace and trust. So building peace through building trust. And uh, I think this is what human rights in general offer. And when it comes to uh, religiosity, to to also inter-religious uh, cooperation, communication here, FOB has a, a particular uh, uh, potential, trust building. And of course, trust 
uh, in an open society can never be blind trust, but it can only be a critical trust where people can talk, where people can raise questions, express doubts, also come up maybe with um, uh, dissenting voices and, and, uh, and positions. So one consequence is, is that a genuine peace where people really are on board and also ex can, 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 can experience being taken seriously in their various positions, in their various observations. Uh, a genuine peace can never be an entirely, uh, can never be silent. Uh, uh, peace has a noisy element. And uh, here uh, I would for once quote a German philosopher, Immanuel Kant, who in a famous treatise on, um, on uh, peace, um, uh, he even called it perpetual peace, sustainable peace, said peace must be different from the tranquility of the graveyards, something very, very different. Yeah? So because human beings are beings with convictions, with different conviction, and that diversity cannot unfold without a certain noise. So that's why I would also distinguish between peace and harmony. So maybe harmony is also something positive, but as you know, harmony sometimes can also be a pretext for silencing people, for silencing dissent. And this should not happen. Genuine peace is not tranquility. And the peace project represented by human rights and also by freedom of religion or belief will be a peace project that cannot be too harmonious. It is a peace project where various voices, different voices really come to the fore. Thank you very much for your patience. And now I stop my, my little and simple PowerPoint. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Heiner. This is very interesting. And then um, you said that is human rights is actually a not too harmonious peace project. So, because I think in Indonesia we have, yeah. harmony is always like the main value and it's always like a target for for bringing people together. And then it becomes, like I said before, that it, it's simplifying to, into public order instead of what you probably say as a tranquility, graveyard, graveyard tranquility, yeah? <laughs> Thank you. So I think um, now we, we come to the session for the question and answer. We have a very intriguing uh, discussion and then presentation from Professor Heiner. So I would, uh, I would open for three uh, people two questions to from the floor and from the zoom from the participants in the zoom as well uh, mas iqbal from the from the room the offline room can also uh, tell me who will <laughs> submit the, the questions anybody from the zoom if you want to ask Yes, I've, I've already seen one uh, Zoom question myself. Um, no, actually, there are a number of Zoom questions now. Ah, okay, from the chat. So from Willen, thank you so much, Professor Bielefeld, for this lecture. I learned a lot. My question, how would you define a culture of human rights in relation to human rights as international law? And then the second one from Paul. So yeah. you authored a remarkable range of insightful reports during your time as special rapporteur. If you were choosing some new projects or recommending them to a successor, do you have recommendations? So yeah. one more uh, from okay, the... No, uh, <laughs> oh, you want, to, uh, you want to answer first? Let me start. Let me start. Okay, okay. Uh, with uh, uh, the first question by Willem, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, okay, uh, yeah, uh, the relationship, the relationship between uh, uh, international law and culture. Yeah, I mean, we tend to talk about human rights as legal norms, and of course, uh, human rights are uh, anchored in international law, and that is very important. Uh, uh, but uh, I think uh, we have also to spell out the significance of human rights in non-legal terms. 
and uh, maybe also with the current crisis of international law, with the rise of autocratic governments, it's, I think it's all the more important that we really condense the core message of human rights. And let me, uh, if, 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 if uh, the, the core message for me of human rights is solidarity in a spirit of respect. Solidarity, working together, but respecting different positions, different uh, political opinions, different religious orientations, um, also in terms of gender issues, there's also diversity. So respecting diversity and cooperating in a spirit of solidarity across that difference. I mean, somehow that is the spirit of human rights. And uh, that spirit, of course, in order to unfold practical significance also needs the letters of the law and the institutions of the law. Uh, but maybe it's not less important to also talk about, to identify the spirit of the law, the spirit of human rights. And here I would really say solidarity uh, in respect, to make it very, very simple, uh, solidarity in respect. And, um, uh, and uh, based on that, I think uh, it's really also up to local people to develop a culture of human rights. And uh, that's uh, always, I mean, it never starts from scratch because I mean, it would be impossible to, to even try to start uh, to, to develop such a culture from nothingness. There's al always something on which you can base that. In all the various uh, cultural traditions, we have the idea of solidarity and also we have the idea of respect. And now the, the, the challenge is to somehow bring that together with also the no legal standards so that the legal standards get a backing in those also local cultures and vice versa that uh, also uh, local cultures may receive a backing through international norms and maybe also a new orientation through international norms. Um, uh, so uh, there I do see uh, that, that uh, relation. And um, uh, as I said, uh, such a culture also with the institutional backing is the antidote to corruption, to distrust, mistrust, conspiracy, and allows um, um, the development of uh, trust, yeah? which is of, and trust needs to be cultivated. Yeah? And that's, uh, all, that's something that people have to do in real encounters. That's why you have to develop such a culture, but I'm sure it is already there to a degree. It's always somehow there to a certain degree, and then you can build up on that. I'm not sure whether this is an answer, Willem, but it's what I can, just say, trying to, 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 to improvise. Now to Cole, to Cole's uh, question, uh, one of the neglected areas in uh, four is uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, uh, and um, uh, I, uh, I think uh, this is uh, really, uh, it's, it's, it's overdue to really go deeply into an analysis of uh, freedom of religion or belief of indigenous peoples. And uh, this will not be possible without also putting uh, the existing norms of FORP to a scrutiny. And maybe, I mean, uh, the, also the standards of FORP have always changed in, uh, in uh, uh, response to maybe new issues coming up new complaints, uh, new experiences of injustice, of violations. Uh, so far, indigenous peoples have been much less vocal in bringing their issues to the fore. Uh, but uh, I'm sure if that happens more and more, uh, we will also update uh, the normative framework to a certain degree. We have to do that. And, and, and uh, really also maybe rediscover elements of FORP uh, that so far uh, have been neglected, uh, including, for instance, the uh, community dimension, which in some textbooks still receives, I would say, too little attention. So the community dimension, which uh, with indigenous peoples is, of course, very obvious, very strong. And also religiosity outside of uh, holy books, uh, the oral traditions. I mean, they, they, these realities have always existed, but so far they have not received uh, adequate treatment also in the operationalization of uh, folk as international standards. So I think that would be one uh, issue where uh, we should invest more energy. 
and let me give you a second example, domestic workers. Uh, and in particular, the female domestic workers, there's also a, a pronounced gender dimension. Uh, I remember also visiting some Middle Eastern countries where no one really knew how many domestic workers or many uh, migrant workers existed in those countries. And many of them are invisible because they work in private households. The majority of those invisible migrants are women. Uh, in a country like Qatar, where the uh, uh, world championship of, of the football soccer world championship will be held, maybe they're, they're the number of Hindus is three times as many as Muslims, even though it's supposedly a Muslim country. Because, because I mean, uh, Hindu, people from Hindu backgrounds, they work as uh, migrants there. Uh, and uh, again, some uh, as uh, domestic workers. And with domestic workers, we really have the paradigm of invisible minorities, uh, where uh, lack of visibility, uh, uh, increased vulnerability due to uh, legal uh, regulations or lack of residence permits, um, uh, gender-related vulnerabilities really come together. And uh, I think this is a problem of enormous dimension which we so far have hardly tackled, at least not in a systematic manner. And there will be much to discover. These are just two examples. Thank you, Professor Heiner. There is another question in the Zoom from Cherry and George. So thanks, Professor Bielefeld, for your excellent points. It seems that inspiring interreligious projects tend to be small scale and often face-to-face. -face. Why is it so difficult to scale up these projects to the national level? Can you address yeah, that? Yeah, uh, maybe we should even uh, overcome the idea of projects. I mean, sometimes uh, at least we should not limit um, inter-religious communication to projects. Sometimes we need projects. Projects are some, they are a little bit outside of the ordinary. Uh, so uh, I, just a few days ago, I visited a school where they had a project day against racism. Yeah, okay. And then with such a extra day, we, of course, invest uh, uh, additional attention to something, but the important point is it should actually work on a daily basis. And uh, so um, projects are important, but maybe what is more important is to develop an everyday culture of encounters. And that, that has much to do with institutions. So for instance, with the institution of schools, uh, I visited countries in uh, where um, uh, children from different strata of society would hardly meet in school because of the uh, uh, stratification existing in the society. Poor and rich ones. And uh, sometimes, uh, I mean, the poor neighborhoods were in certain cities of Lebanon, for instance, the poor neighborhoods in some of these cities were Sunni Muslims, uh, the rich neighborhoods um, uh, Catholics, um, and uh, the school system would uh, somehow keep them rather apart. Uh, so uh, when talking about interreligious communication and encounters, I would not just talk about projects, if, even though projects are important, but more important are the, uh, uh, the, the structures of a society so that uh, people uh, uh, meet uh, in school, uh, and the school is uh, such an important place because it, it, it has a, a huge role to play for the formative years of a young person. So getting to know people on a daily basis, people of a different religion, and to experience that they are just like all others, where they have, of course, a different orientation, but we can play together, we can work together. I mean, that is, I think, uh, an experience uh, for the rest of the lives and for the society. Likewise, also neighborhoods. So the, 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 the way we design neighborhoods in cities, um, uh, it should actually uh, facilitate encounters. Uh, and uh, it's often that in, um, in, in big companies, uh, people meet across uh, denominational differences. In smaller companies, less so. In good schools, uh, there's a lot of openness. Sometimes in the poor schools, less so. So there's also the, that economic dimension uh, uh, to be taken into account. Yeah, um, your question were, was of a general nature. Maybe my answer cannot be more than just uh, raise a few points or hint to issues that, of course, would deserve a much more 
uh, detailed analysis. Thank you, Professor Heiner. So we have three people actually from the offline room. Uh, Professor Otto. You, yeah, uh, we have three questions from the floor. Renata, can we Please go let ahead. them ask? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Otto Gusti from the Lederlo School of Philosophy, Flores NTT, Eastern Indonesia. Uh, thank you for your uh, insightful presentation, Professor uh, Bielefeld. At the beginning of your presentation, uh, you said that we need freedom of religion not to protect religion, but uh, religious people or believers because uh, they are human beings and human beings are uh, vulnerable. Uh, Sorry, I can't hear you any longer. Can you hear me now? Yeah. No, it's gone. No, yeah. Hello? Yes. Yeah. Uh, such an idea is often uh, criticized as a nope. li liberal uh, understanding of human rights and is contrary to the multicultural understanding of human rights, uh, which uh, emphasizes the importance of uh, social dimensions of uh, human being. And uh, from this point of view, religions and cultures need to be protected from the attacks of uh, global cultures, for example, and for uh, traditional society. Uh, religions are often uh, the last uh, institutions used to protect or to defend themselves. And furthermore, the third generation of human rights uh, points out the importance of the protection of minority uh, religions and, and cultures. I would like to hear your comments to uh, such uh, critic or thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, thank you so much uh, for your uh, question. <clears throat> this year, we will celebrate uh, the 30th birthday of another important UN document, which is the Minorities Declaration. And <clears throat> what I really like about the Minorities Declaration is its title. Uh, because, I mean, the key word in that title is belonging. So it's uh, the Declaration on the Rights of Persons Belonging to National, Ethnic, National, Linguistic, Religious Minorities. Persons Belonging to Minorities. Why do I like that? Because it cuts across that artificial dichotomy of the individual juxtaposed against the collective unit. Here, the abstract individual, here, the abstract collectivity. Instead, I mean, human rights, and I'm not sure whether that the classical liberal paradigm, probably not. In my view, human rights uh, 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 facilitate belonging, yeah? But uh, freely defined belonging, people should really uh, have the space to define who they are, but always in relation to others. I mean, we find ourselves in relations. We are always in a, within a web of relations, but not just um, exposed to that web, but we are also we are weaving ourselves. So we are active parts of that web. So uh, rights of persons belonging to minorities. I mean, that is somehow uh, a title that I like. And this declaration, uh, of course, deals with um, the danger uh, that um, various minorities experience, and it's the risk, the increased risk of forced assimilation. So, uh, and uh, the answer is not to freeze, let's say, collective identities, but the answer is to empower people to um, mobilize also their energies, 
So uh, to quote from that uh, uh, declaration from the 1992 Declaration on Minorities, on persons belonging to minorities, the state is in charge of providing favorable conditions, favorable conditions so that minorities can flourish. But still, I mean, it's people who have to do it. Yeah? So it's not the state protecting a certain minority religion against changes. If people want to change, if people want to even assimilate on a voluntary basis, okay, that's nothing we can do about anything, I mean, from a human rights perspective. Uh, but uh, creating, at least facilitating the, the possibility for them to sustain their ways of life also their community institutions, if they wish so. And that, I think, goes beyond uh, the traditional liberal understanding, um, while still insisting on human beings as the right holders, but in a complex way, yeah? within that interconnectedness of human beings and that web of uh, significance that we particularly appreciate with religiosity. I mean, religion really is so significant for uh, uh, human life and uh, also for community life, for ethical values. And uh, that is a reality in which we find ourselves. It's not something we create as individuals. Yeah? So we are somehow, we are uh, uh, born within such a web and then we can also ac actively contribute. So um, uh, freedom of religion and belief is in that sense, uh, it's a human right. It focuses on human beings, but human beings are very complex beings and uh, they are not alone. They're always together with others and live in that uh, complex web of significance to which they can also actively contribute. That would be my understanding. Thank you, Professor Heinrich. I'm not sure whether, whether this is an answer to your question. I hope. <laughs> Okay, so we have two other questions from the floor. Please go ahead. Uh, terima kasih. Saya akan bertanya dalam bahasa Indonesia. Uh, kita ingat ya pesan Romo Magni Suseno. Kalau saya tidak lupa itu pada konferensi apa di tahun 2010 di Jakarta. Jadi salah satu pesan Romo Magni Suseno itu perdamaian itu sama halnya mendidik anak. Mengajari perdamaian itu sama halnya kita belajar menjadi orang tua. Bagi Frans untuk bicara perdamaian, mewujudkan perdamaian itu tidak pernah berhenti gitu. Jadi terus berlanjut, terus berjalan. Jadi pertanyaan saya yang pertama, bagaimana mungkin perdamaian manusia itu dapat diwujudkan sementara sementara tadi kita sebut atau di Indonesia itu kita tahu banyak ratusan kepercayaan banyak agama sementara kita juga kenal bahwa ada satu pernyataan penting dan menarik misalnya tidak ada perdamaian dunia kalau tidak ada perdamaian antar agama tidak akan ada perdamaian antar agama kalau tidak ada perdamaian di dalam internal agama di Indonesia dengan berbagai apa dengan ratusan uh, kepercayaan dengan banyaknya agama Kalau sekarang kita lihat mungkin sulit gitu. Itu yang pertama. Yang kedua. Sebentar. Pertanyaannya apa tadi? Bagaimana perdamaian manusia itu dapat diwujudkan jika berbagai macam agama, berbagai ratusan kepercayaan misalnya di Indonesia itu masih ada. Masih ada. Ya. Okay. Saya terjemahkan dulu okay. ya. Oke, okay, let me translate this first. There's a statement from um, Romo Magnis uh, Suseno. Uh, the late Romo Magnus in 2010 at a conference, his message was that, you know, building peace is like educating. It's like uh, educating children. It's like uh, learning to be a parent again. So the question is, you know, how can, and it's a never ending process. The question is, how can peace be realized uh, if, for instance, in Indonesia, we have hundreds or perhaps thousands of religions and there's a famous saying that there can be no peace if there is no peace between religions, and there can be no peace if there is no peace within religions. How uh, can that be possible? That's the first question, and he has another. Okay, berikutnya. Uh, tadi ada apa? Ada ada satu poin yang saya catat dan penting itu kepercayaan kritis. Artinya tidak ada kepercayaan buta. Uh, mungkin kalau saya Kebetulan beberapa hari ini lagi fokus baca pidato-pidato Soekarno. 
Dan memang uh, Soekarno ini saya pikir di era-era dia memimpin Indonesia sampai era tahun 65 itu pikiran-pikirannya mungkin apa ya sangat progresif, kemudian sosialis dan lain sebagainya. Uh, Soekarno itu sangat terbuka, tapi untuk membangun kepercayaan kritis seperti yang disampaikan Pak Heiner tadi, apa ya, sangat sangat tidak bisa saya bayangkan untuk di Indonesia. Misalnya uh, tadi juga ada bicara tentang bagaimana kalau kelompok kanan dihapuskan atau di Indonesia misalnya beberapa waktu lalu ada pelarangan buku. Sementara sebenarnya kalau buku itu kan ya mungkin tidak ada pengaruh apa-apa bagi masyarakat. Mungkin bagi kaum-kaum akademisi aja yang bisa paham. Begitu juga misalnya di negara-negara Timur Tengah. Untuk berpikir kritis saja mungkin bisa di, sudah langsung di dijas. Kamu memilih istri kamu berkeluarga di sini atau kamu pindah ke negara lain. Artinya untuk apa? Untuk mewujudkan atau mungkin dengan kita berharap dengan kepercayaan kritis tadi di tengah-tengah masyarakat apalagi yang uh, sangat terbuka sekarang ini uh, mungkin kita perlu pandangan Pak Henner pada uh, jawaban ini. Terima kasih. Jadi yang kedua bukan pertanyaan tapi minta pandangan Pak Henner. Oke. Okay. Okay, and the second is actually asking uh, your views on uh, your point about uh, critical building critical trust rather than blind trust. Um, yeah. Lately, he's been reading the speeches of Sukarno, the first president of Indonesia, you know, who uh, led the country until 1965. Back then, at the time, he was progressive for his time, socialist, a lot of socialist views there. He's very open, but I cannot imagine how Uh, building critical trust can be possible in Indonesia. We heard earlier, for instance, uh, in this room, statements about what if you know the left has been banned, but what if we also ban the right, uh, uh, political right in Indonesia? And we also see uh, banning of books in Indonesia. That's it's very difficult uh, in in light of that to build critical trust. Like we also see examples in the Middle East. Um, a lot of you know when you start to think critically, people judge you for it. So. Um, would you kindly enlighten us uh, in this regard, with this reality, uh, what are the ways by which we can build critical trust? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I wish I had all the answers. Um, okay. Peace implies education, And uh, it implies educating ourselves, not just educating others. And uh, 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 the, uh, the person who asked the question, uh, the, the gentleman, uh, sorry, I missed the name, uh, spoke as far as, as I could understand from the translation about peace between religions. But first of all, I think we have to discover the peace potential also within religious traditions. And in various religious traditions, we can discover both the potential for peace, but sometimes also an inclination to uh, resort to violence. Uh, I mean, much violence is happening in the name of religion. And <clears throat> I think what we need is a broad consensus uh, that violence happening in the name of religion always amounts to destroying religion. Violence in the name of religion is never in the interest of religion. It destroys the spiritual messages of religions. And uh, uh, religious leaders and uh, intellectuals operating in various religions have a particular responsibility to be very clear and to condemn any act of violence occurring in the name of religion by unmasking that as what it is. It's typically not a manifestation of religious zeal, but of human arrogance. Of human arrogance, people pretending to serve as executors of the divine will. And sometimes they, they stage themselves as humble followers but it's a manifestation of human hubris and human arrogance. So I think religious leaders have a particular role in unmasking exactly that. But also the ordinary followers of religions should, whenever such an act of violence occurs or incitement to violence in the name of religion, 
they should always say not in my name, not in the name of my religion. And I've seen that happening in many parts of the world where really people assembly around that uh, clear understanding, we have to reject violence in the name of our religion and we have to speak out very clearly and very quickly. So that's a responsibility of religious leaders but also of ordinary followers of religions. And of course, there's also that uh, the responsibility also of the state of uh, protecting everyone uh, from uh, hate, uh, from manifestations of hatred, from incitement to hatred. I know, I mean, this is only a sketchy answer. It's a sketchy answer to an enormously difficult problem. And if you want to, um, to develop uh, fitting answers, suitable answers, these answers will always be contextual answers. So you have to work that out in Indonesia and also see what the potential of the Indonesian society is in this regard. Yeah, critical trust. Yeah, maybe that has something to do also with the understanding of peace as harmony. I think genuine peace is not harmonious, not, not too harmonious. And also uh, uh, general trust, genuine trust also, uh, is can, it can only be a trust that comes from the human mind and the human mind needs respect as a critical mind. And maybe we have to understand that, that criticism is uh, just part of normal human encounters in politics, in religion, that uh, expressing a critical attitude is not um, uh, a manifestation of disloyalty, but it's, it's actually a form of loyalty. It's helpful, it's helpful, it's constructive. At least it can be constructive. So uh, developing that mindset is certainly a long-term project. But I'm sure Indonesia is already in the midst of such a development. I remember when I was uh, there talking to NGOs and also talking about the notion of harmony. Some people, okay, I, say, I saw certain ironic smiles in people's faces. So somehow you have an understanding that also harmony can become a pretext. I'm personally, I'm a very harmonious person. I like harmony, yeah, but it should be genuine. It should be genuine. I think people have an understanding. Yeah. So I trust there is a potential in, in Indonesia. I'm, I'm very sure. Uh, I remember a um, uh, very productive discussion. I was impressed also by uh, the wisdom, by the knowledge, and also the judgment that people are able to, 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 to express. Thank you, Professor Heiner. So we have not, uh, the third questions from the floor. Please go ahead. Terima kasih. Uh, selamat malam, Mr. Henner. Uh, saya cukup sedikit saja pertanyaan saya. Uh, karya Bapak merupakan rujukan utama bagi KBB di Indonesia. Pertanyaan saya, sebelum Bapak turun ke lapangan itu, tugas Bapak apa sebagai jurnalis saja, atau sebagai aktivis, atau sebagai uh, akademisi, atau sebagai apa? Penyelesaian masalah. Jadi, kerangka konsep apa sebelum Bapak turun ke lapangan e, ketika keliling dunia itu. Mungkin itu sederhana saja, karena saya melihat bukunya sangat menarik, tapi e, ya itu tadi, ada beberapa yang muncul pertanyaan di belakangnya. Mungkin demikian, Pak. Oke, okay. my question is very brief. Uh, your work, your, uh, your book is, has been the main reference for uh, Forb in Indonesia. My, I'm, I'm just really curious, before you became the special rapporteur, uh, what, were you, uh, what did you do? Were you a journalist, an academic? Uh, because I'm curious about the conceptual framework that you applied. And you know, reading your book, it, it roused my curiosity here about, <laughs> uh, <laughs> about that. You know, what, uh, what was the conceptual framework before you started traveling the world as a special rapporteur for uh, freedom of religion and belief? That's it. Okay, thank you so much for this question. And uh, I never planned to become a special rapporteur. It was a, a, a huge surprise. <laughs> to be nominated <clears throat> and um, it was uh, a wonderful experience, which after a few years had to come to its end. I wouldn't have survived it much longer. Um, uh, but uh, before working as a special rapporteur, 
I, uh, for a number of years, uh, directed, uh, served as director of the German Institute for Human Rights, which is the equivalent of the Indonesian uh, Human Rights Commission. So the National uh, Human Rights Institute. And I, I, I repeatedly also met uh, colleagues from Indonesia, from the Indonesian Commission uh, of Human Rights. So I was the German chairperson for a number of years, of course, based in Berlin. And uh, uh, I have an academic background, so my, uh, my uh, basic uh, discipline is philosophy, in fact. But also I have a degree in theology. I used to work in law faculty, so I'm a hybrid academic. So not at home in any discipline. I always feel a little bit like a migrant worker, uh, even in what's, what's is, what is supposed my discipline, philosophy. Now, with the analytical philosophy becoming more and more hegemonic, I don't understand it any longer. So I feel like a migrant, but a happy migrant in that huge area of academia, not being at home in any of the disciplines, but okay, flexible and trying to learn and learn and learn. And so it was in that spirit that I tried to do my job as a special rapporteur. Uh, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. Thank you, Professor Heiner. Okay, there is one more, I think, from the floor. Mas Anchu, yeah. Please go ahead. And to <laughs> uh, actually, there is no can. Yeah, yeah. You can. You can go first. Can I ask the question or I yeah, we please have go to ahead. wait? Okay. No, no, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Trisno and I'm working at the uh, Interfaith Dialogue. Uh, I used to hear that there are two kinds of uh, phrases that used to be uh, what? To describe what happened in, in, in the in the problem of religious belief. First is the so-called religious liberty, and the other is religious freedom. I think it is, even though it is, looks similar, but I think it is a very different aspect in, 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 in the scope of that uh, protection. For me, religious liberty is more in the external factor, like you cannot force the, uh, the conviction of others, there is no persecution, something like that. But freedom, it means more into uh, an inner orientation or an autonomous uh, decision to have your own conviction. I want to uh, hear your elaboration on that uh, two terms that Sometimes we use we use it uh, interchangeably in Indonesia. So kemerdekaan beragama dan kebebasan beragama. But for me, it's very different uh, scope in the in the in the discourse. Maybe you can elaborate more. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, just, just to let you know, Professor Heiner, Trisno is your is the translator of your book with Wiener. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. I mean, it was a great honor to have this book also translated to Indonesian. And uh, so I, I, I owe you a lot. Um, uh, thank you so much. And your question, yeah. Um, you know, I'm not a native English speaker. So maybe also I tend to use these terms more or less interchangeable, interchangeably. But I think you are right. I mean, there are different dimensions. There are different dimensions. I mean, freedom from external forces. And there maybe we should then use the term liberty. Yeah, maybe that is the, the, the typical place for liberty. Yeah, so against external constraints. So we have to liberate ourselves also to have to yeah, establish liberty against. But then uh, freedom, I mean, freedom also uh, has something, as you say, to do with my internal conviction, with the core of my being. Yeah, so being convinced of something 
And that conviction is, by the way, is not only um, uh, 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 to, uh, yeah, it, it, it's not just a matter of choice, by the way. I mean, we use we, 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 we use the term choice very frequently in international human rights law, uh, but choice merely means you open a space where then something happens. But the existential uh, significance of a genuine, of any genuine conviction also implies an understanding, yeah, it's not just a matter of choice. There's also my existential, my very, the core of my being is involved in that. So it's not something I choose like a commodity in a market. And they are, they, these are some of the misunderstandings that come with the predominantly liberal paradigm of freedom of religion or other uh, human rights that we, 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 we may think, mistakenly think, that it's all about choosing, choosing, choosing like uh, in a marketplace. And that is just the external dimension. The, ex the existential experience is something very, very different. And maybe that's also something we have to voice more clearly in human rights discussions in order to avoid misunderstandings. The co commodified understanding of uh, religiosity in a marketplace where then human rights somehow open up the market. I think that is not uh, uh, in, in, in full justice to what human beings experience as believers and many would be willing to even take some risks and disadvantages in order to, to remain faithful to their convictions. Thank you, Professor Heiner. I think there is one last question in the Zoom that's already been yeah. uh, stated yeah. so from Chris Harianto. While the state must provide an inclusive and just space of interreligious engagement, what the state should do for the specific society like the indigenous who are mostly less used to involve or be involved in such engagement, to what extent the state should engage them distinctively, considering also the need to avoid differentiation that could lead to discrimination. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I mean, um, uh, I think that always um, requires sensitive handling. I mean, we have to, of course, to, to, to be aware of differences, while at the same time avoiding what some would call othering. So we have to be very much aware there are differences, but we are not the ones putting people into boxes. And um, uh, so, uh, uh, and, uh, so really giving people uh, the space to articulate themselves, who they are, how they want to be treated, and to what degree, for instance, indigenous origin, indigenous uh, communities really play a role. So we can we should not take that for granted knowing there is a person coming from an indigenous uh, tribe community now we use maybe the language of indigenous peoples that let's wait maybe they have different interests maybe they just want to benefit from freedom of religion like every other without taking that indigenous dimension uh, um, uh, without without according uh, 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 high significance to the indigenous dimension but it can also be different uh, uh, so I think human rights work, above all, implies cultivating the art of listening, listening very carefully. And listening means also learning languages. Uh, listening means uh, being very grateful to interpreters, because no one can learn too many languages. Yeah? So we should not deceive ourselves. Uh, that's why we rely on interpretation. And when it comes to indigenous languages, there's typically a shortage of interpretations uh, or inter interpreters. Uh, 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 so uh, the uh, human rights practice can only do justice to human beings when cultivating that art of listening very carefully and listening, listening to the nuances. And maybe in no area is that so obvious as in the area of freedom of religion or belief. And with the indigenous people, peoples, we are at the rather at the beginning of a learning process, because so far they have not been listened to. That's what many of them would say. But they have, they have, they are the ones who have to voice their concerns and also their interest. Um, so may, I'm not sure whether this is an answer to your question, but I uh, love to take that opportunity to also thank uh, the interpreters once again. 
Actually, I have to be in a meeting in Pakistan in five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. So I think we have to conclude now. Thank you very much, Professor Heiner. I think we learned a lot from now, from now actually. And then I we have applause to Professor Heiner. I think I'm pretty much very uh, 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 learned about the critical trust and it's really about communication and listening. So I think these two words is really strong and then making sure that this, there is a societal uh, peace that can be established here. Thank, thank you, you, Professor thanks Heiner. You. And thanks, uh, Renata, for moderating this, yeah? Thank you. All the best. Bye. Bye, bye, everyone in the, in the room. <laughs> yeah. okay. I think we can dismiss. Bye. Thank you.